So at the end of the day, you are going to be hard pressed to convince me that your ADHD has ruined or impaired your life. You are a ridiculously successful woman who has a full life with a family, a career, impact. And I would never want you to think that your ADHD has stood in the way. Your ADHD symptoms may be the reason you have achieved as much as you have. And so although the teachers may have said, this is bad, stop behaving this way, smarten up, read faster, what's wrong with you, why didn't you comprehend that book the way we everybody else did, why can't you sit still, why are you always trying to show off, why are you always looking for attention? Now, those very traits may actually be what are fueling your success. And I would not, I would really hate to see you medicate away your success so that you can become a mediocre human being. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dr. We, Palmer. We, we don't want that. Wow. So, well, I'm on the other side of it. So let's also like put into context, I'm now 55 and I have been utilizing medication. And what's interesting is I only take it in environments where I think I need it. Like I didn't take medication this morning because I knew that we would be doing this interview and being in an environment with lights on and microphones, I feel so focused because my adrenaline is going that the metabolism is probably different than if I'm just trying to get stuff done around the house. And so I want to go back, though, to somebody who feels like their inability to pay attention or their inability to be still is causing anxiety. It is creating a ruckus in their life because having practiced for 30 years, you have seen plenty of people where ADHD is not fueling their success because it's out of control. So yes. based on the energy brain theory and 30 years as a, as a Harvard psychiatrist, what are the new research-supported breakthroughs in terms of what you would tell somebody listening to implement immediately if they or somebody that they love is in the category of really kind of struggling with a brain that is not metabolizing correctly and it's showing up as ADHD? So if the symptoms are clearly interfering with ability to function. And what does that look like? If it's a child, let's say, not doing well in school at all, getting very poor grades, getting into trouble all the time, has trouble keeping friends even hmm. because friends feel like he's too wild. He's out of control. He doesn't sit still. He's always getting into trouble. I want to stay away from him. So this kid feels dumb, feels like he's a troublemaker because all the teachers are telling him that. Or and a weirdo. And, or a weirdo. And all the kids, uh, all the other kids are even agreeing. And, and certainly if the the parents and the family feel the same way, um, like you're just a troublemaker. Why can't you sit still? Why don't you do what you're told? Then I would say, okay, things aren't going well for this kid. So we have all of the basic treatment options still on the table. Psychotherapy, behavioral interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy, all those things, and stimulants and a, a couple of other medications, mm -hmm. those are all on the table. And those may all play a role. But again, they may or may not work. For some people, they can make the condition even worse because now they're interfering with your sleep or mm -hmm. they're making kids like a different person, a monster. So if that's the case, but I would argue even before you get to medications, Let's do a common sense assessment of some basic lifestyle factors. Is the person eating mostly processed foods? Is the person getting adequate nutrition? So that means adequate vitamins, minerals, 
other nutrients, adequate protein. Is that happening? Yes or no? Like you said, there can be lots of reasons. Picky right. eater, right. upset stomach, all... I get it. I, I can hear all those questions, but if those things are not happening, if person is not getting adequate, healthy nutrition, that needs to be on the table as one possible intervention of something that we might want to look at to address. I think it's even more important than that because I have never been in a psychiatrist, psychologist, neuropsych evaluation, therapist's office where the first thing that somebody asks is, well, what are you eating and how much exercise are you getting? And there's typically a question about screen time at the end and to kind of limit it, but not from a metabolic standpoint. The conversation is always like, how do you feel? What are you thinking about? What do you want to talk about today? And you're talking about physical changes in your lifestyle that have a direct research back impact on your brain's metabolism, which impacts ADHD, and anything that's neurodivergent. Yes. That what we're eating is affecting the way your brain functions, which may in fact be playing a role in what you're thinking, how pessimistic or how optimistic you are, whether you have crippling depression or anxiety, or whether you have mild depression or anxiety, or whether you have mild concentration problems or not, or whether you're happy and healthy, and that we need comprehensive human health care. We need to look at the whole person and we need to understand that what they're putting into their mouth and whether they're sleeping at night and whether they're on screens, what they're doing affects their brain too. This makes so much sense because we know it in the opposite, right? Like if I come home from a stressful week of work and I make a beeline for like one of those burgers you know, that you need both hands to hold. And as you <laughs> squeeze it in on the brioche bun, it starts dripping grease down your arms. And I'm like, vroom, 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 and I'm eating the fries. And then I slug it down with a beer. What do I feel like after that? I feel like a human job of the hut. I just want to slither down into my chair. I am low energy, lay in there. And the thing that I put in my mouth absolutely changes the energy in my body and the way that my brain is functioning. And so from a common sense standpoint, this makes perfect sense. So depends on the person and different people are going to do better with different diets. I just want to say that up front. Okay. I also want to be respectful of people's dietary preferences and choices. So if you want to be vegan or vegetarian or omnivore or whatever, you can do that. However, there are some common themes. So if you have a child with very severe kind of neurodiversity that's uh -huh. really interfering with life, um, if maybe they have ADHD and they're a little bit on the spectrum and they've got some learning disorder issues and other things, you know, one thing to consider would be an elimination diet. There are lots of different types, but elimination diets are basically looking for food sensitivities. So is this person in front of us, is their brain function being impacted by the, the gut brain connection? That's really the question we're asking. More and more research is telling us, yes, there is a very strong bi-directional relationship between the gut and the brain. So the brain impacts the gut, the gut impacts the brain. And that means if you're eating food like gluten and you're allergic to it, it's inflaming your gut. And that is traveling up to the brain, that message at least, is getting up to the brain and influencing your brain function. And that might result in ADHD or other neurodivergent symptoms. I just want to be clear that I'm tracking. You're basically saying that if you have a child with ADHD, or even if you are an adult that suspects that this could be you, simply trying an elimination diet, that by removing certain food groups and seeing how you respond from a metabolism standpoint, you could see a dramatic reduction in mental health symptoms or focus symptoms because your thesis and all your research is that 
anything that your body is processing, it is either going to be good energy or it could really interfere with the energy that your brain needs. And when that happens, you start to have these symptoms of being neurodivergent. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So if you are allergic to gluten and you're eating gluten, it could cause ADHD symptoms. It could cause anxiety. It could cause you to feel depressed. And simply figuring that out could actually alleviate those symptoms? 100%. And That's there, insane. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people like that. Who you know what I love about you and your research? Because I'm just really getting this now that we are in part two of this series, is that we've been thinking about food in the wrong way. Like when I think about friends that have allergies, you think about allergy because you swell or you itch or your neck swells. You're actually saying that same crap is happening in your brain. Yes. Of course it is. Of course and that's is. causing you to be anxious. And so think about sensitivity to food and the way that your body can't really metabolize it as affecting absolutely everything, but especially that thing between your ears that is the conductor for your entire life, that it is swelling because of it, it is misfiring because of it. And so starting with an elimination diet would be revelatory in terms of what you might discover about how you feel. Yes. And it's, for most people, it's a big ask. An elimination diet is not easy, depending on how many things you're going to eliminate, what you're going to do. But for most people, they can figure it out within about two weeks. So if you eliminate a wide range of foods over two weeks. Um, and there are some classic ones, gluten. Some people are sensitive to dairy. Other people might be sensitive to soy. Um, sugar. Sugar. Uh, some people can be sensitive to artificial dyes and sweeteners and other things. So if you go with a Whole30 kind of diet or something else, that's going to eliminate a lot of those types of foods. Yeah. And you give it two weeks. If you notice dramatic improvement in your brain function, now you've got a little bit of a project on your hands. And now you have to figure out what exactly am I sensitive to? Because you're probably not sensitive to all of it. And you want to come up with the least restrictive, most fun, easy diet to do. So you want to really try to see, can I zero in? Can I add some of these foods back? And as you're adding those foods back, you're really paying attention to the brain symptoms to see, am I getting worse? Are things coming back? And if, if symptoms are coming back when you add back gluten, then you know, okay, gluten was it. And maybe I would do better with a gluten-free diet. If you don't want to do an elimination diet or if an elimination diet doesn't necessarily tell you what you want to know or doesn't give you the symptoms, higher protein, lower carbohydrate, Sticking primarily with whole, real foods more than you normally do. What I'm hearing is I'm hearing chicken cutlets, not chicken nuggets for all you moms and dads out yep. there. <laughs> Absolutely. A lot of people will notice significant benefit, and I would give that probably at least a month. What is actually happening in the functioning of your brain when you are somebody that has ADHD? 